Hello all, this week we are sitting down with another excellent guest for an amazing interview. We are talking with Jesse Sendejas from bands Escape from the Zoo, Chad Hates George, and the very well-known and very well-loved Days and Days, one of the best folk punk bands out there. Hope you enjoy this one. Welcome to the Boston Art Podcast. Boston's premier art podcast. Where we talk art, culture, and philosophy. My name is Theodora Earthworms. And I am Brian Huntress. Welcome to the show. I guess, how are you doing tonight? How's life? It's, I mean, I can't complain. <laughs> <laughs> Still yeah. breathing. Right. And are you, uh, are you touring right now? I know you've been, um, you know, and for uh, I'm sure we'll get into it, but, you know, you have a, a very big reputation as a, as a traveling band and, and somebody who's been out on the road for a very long time. Have a, have you been out recently? Um, no, we've kind of been kicking it around Houston. My wife, uh, Veronica, who plays mandolin in Escape from the Zoo, got a job at a GameStop, like, a mile from our apartment, so we kind of just been sticking around so she can, like, submit her relationships there. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Because we're both, you know, huge video game nerds, so mm. it's kind of like a, a dream job. So <laughs> I've been cool. hanging out in Houston, like writing and working on little projects from here. Um, I think the next time we'll be on the road for like an extended period of time will be May with Escape from the Zoo. We're doing the whole West Coast. Mm. Now, I guess just to preface this a little bit or to kind of preamble this entire episode, one thing like... I guess to say I'm really excited to do this interview and to talk to you because, you know, maybe, I don't know if this is like, you know, this is probably kind of dorky, but, you know, to me, you know, you guys, Days and Days and and your various other projects have been like, you know, some of the most listened to and and most notable, you know, projects in the entire folk punk genre, you know, and, 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 and if I'm not mistaken, I guess, it, you know, this is probably debatable, but Days and Days is probably the most popular active folk punk project ever. You know, and, okay. thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, you guys are sick. And the first time, the first and only time I've actually seen you guys play, it's actually kind of a funny story, but you guys were on tour, I think in like, I don't know what year it was. It might have been like 2015 or 16 or something. And you guys had a show in Boston that dropped and you needed the venue. So you guys did like a signal boost post asking if anybody had a space to to host you guys at. And I was about 18 or something at the time. I saw the post and then I lied on the post and said that I had a venue. I said, fuck yeah, I got this. I got this. And... (laughs) And I was working at a, as a dishwasher at the time. And then for the next like seven hours of the day, me and all of my friends frantically were fucking calling everybody we knew trying to get a venue to host you guys. And the show ended up being in my aunt's backyard. Cause she was the only person that, fu- like I called every, every bar, every fucking house, like everybody. And my aunt was just like, I mean, I guess. It's fucking weird. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> thank y'all so much for, for for doing all that. I really appreciate it. I, I admittedly, you know, those years are a little bit hazy. I was, you know, drinking pretty heavily a lot of the time back gotcha. then. So my <laughs> recollection of that show is not, you know, all there. But right, damn dude, I really genuinely appreciate you doing all that. That means a ton. No, of course. I mean, it was like, because we were really, really new to, like, DIY shows at the time and shit like that. So, and, you know, like, we didn't really have a lot of perspective because we're basically still teenagers. So, like, you know, these days, you know, I I talk to somebody in your position or an artist I admire and I could see that you're a regular person living a regular life. But at that time, you know, you guys were fucking legends. Giants, you know, to us because we were a bunch of dumbasses. But you know, it was a, yeah. So it was definitely pretty sick. But I don't know. Now that I told you, I guess that story. Um, I guess for our listeners that don't know, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people tuning in that are that are fans of yours. But for our people that don't know and aren't familiar with what you what you do, I mean, would you be willing to give like kind of a brief, uh, you know, rundown of 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 like who you are and and what projects you're you're currently working on? Sure. Um, 
My name's Jesse Sandejas. I uh, play guitar in a folk punk band called Days and Days that's been around for, Jesus, like 15 years now. God, I feel so old. <laughs> um, and then I, I also play a guitar in a, in a band called Escape from the Zoo that's like an electric project ska punk thing. Oh, that's excellent. What a crazy time. And weren't you, you were also working on a project called Chad Hates George for a while, right? Yeah, well, um, me and my little sister, Marissa, who makes their own music, they're just a phenomenal uh, musician and songwriter. Um, we just wanted to start a project that we could do, the two of us, and just like travel and kind of hang out. Uh, so we started Chad Hates George, where she plays washboard and I play guitar and we just recorded like one album and never really did anything else with it but we still play little like pop-up sets here and there with that band whenever we're in the same city oh that's excellent do you and uh does does marissa live in houston as well no they live in um denver oh excellent now in terms of like your your guitar playing and songwriting and stuff did you um i guess like uh when, like how how did you start out? I guess in terms yeah. of um, I had like a little first act electric guitar when I was a kid, and uh, I, I started off. My my parents raised me on like you know the Ramones and Sex Pistols. My dad's a huge Billy Joel fan, so a lot of that. Um, and then you know I kind of like got into my own like some 41 leftover crack all those kind of bands and i would show that to my parents and they would show me others so like i was raised on music and um when i was maybe like 13 or 14 i started just learning little like ramones covers and you know power chord riffs on that first that guitar and uh that kind of just evolved over the years when i was living in san marcos uh it was just you know there's not a lot to do in that town unless you're super into like college keg parties and shit, which mm-hmm. I was right. football was not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time just sitting at the apartment and, um, just kind of started writing dumb little songs and never stopped, I guess. <laughs> and what, what, uh, how old are you also? Uh, 31. Gotcha. And as of August. Oh, hell yeah. Um, so in, in terms of like your original, days as a musician like where you know and learning all these songs and stuff were you connected to like other musicians or songwriters in your area no i we didn't know anybody in san marcos really um there's a little coffee shop called wake the dead where we would go play like an open mic every now and again um but it wasn't until we came back to our hometown houston um that we kind of started getting involved in the scene we played a show at this place called white swan that's still around (laughs) it's like a classic houston venue Mm. um we played with this ska band i think they're from tucson called aids free they're like sick ass just ska punk band and this dude that was on tour with them named logan green uh who's i'm pretty sure he's still like really active in the in the scene out there uh, asked us if we wanted to go out to tucson to play like a fest and i mean that was after like the first houston show we ever played so of course you know we just told him sure and we packed up and went for it and you know the rest is history i guess <laughs> something that's really cool about a lot of um what you're saying is it seems like community and like family and friends play a pretty big role in a lot of the things that projects you've been working on and opportunities that you've had do you feel like that's an accurate reflection so here you're talking about your sibling and your wife and for friends that you've made and playing around in your hometown and getting into the scene that way um does that sound like it resonates oh yeah definitely um my family and i are super close i mean my mom and dad are about to stop by (laughs) you know have dinner with us here in in a little bit uh excellent you know yeah i play music with my sister whenever i get the chance uh, yeah, family is definitely it plays a huge role in everything we do. I'm super lucky to have the family that I have. They've been so so supportive of like all the ridiculous nonsense that we've uh, attempted to get up to over the years uh, without such a strong uh, support system. There's fucking no way that I, you know I would have been able to do the things that I've done 
For sure. Mm. Now, something I'm curious about too. You talk about you were talking about this this first show that you guys played at. You said it was uh, at this venue. Now, I'm curious to know, like, what were the the following steps in that? Because uh, if I'm not mistaken, were you t- are you referring to the first days and days show, or is this like a first personal experience performing? Yeah, that was the so the first days and days show technically was at that week the Dead Coffee House place in San Marcos, but it was like my folks and Whitney, who plays trumpet in Days and Days, her mom drove up from Houston <laughs> to come see us play this show. You know, air quotes. Uh, we just like asked this coffee shop if we could play one night. Uh, I think there was like two other college kids that there that just like happened to be there working <laughs> on like you know some project or something that watched the set. But the uh, first like show that we were billed on was at the White Swan in Houston uh, as Days and Days, and that's kind of what kicked everything off, I guess. And how did you meet Whitney? just through like mutual friends growing up in the Houston scene, you know, there was like a pretty tight knit scene that uh, kind of revolved around this place called Southmore house that Mm. used to be in Houston. It was just like a warehouse where these kids would put on sick punk shows. (laughs) So we kind of just, you know, met through mutual friends. Right. And that's that's so interesting. And were these like, were the punk shows and the, at this, at this, at this house, at this warehouse, were they put on by, like people that were like older than you guys or like were these like just like other kids your age or something yeah they were like the old heads they were probably like right. you know my age now and when we started going we were like 14 15 uh, but right. man those were that place was so rad there's, there's nothing like those like first punk shows where you have to like you know chug a 40 behind the venue before you go in because you're you know <laughs> too young to buy booze inside and like <laughs> Those are the those are the days for sure. Holy shit! And like when you first were playing, you know, playing those initial first shows, like you have all of these like wonderful experiences at, at, at Texas, like local punk shows. Like, did you have any notion of the traveling lifestyle, the touring lifestyle, like this really like hardcore, you know, like way of life uh, associated with folk punk? Like, did you? like see that in your cards like at all like in in those early days no not even a little bit are we uh it was kind of just like a street punk scene was was like the thing in houston when we were growing up so Mm -hmm. it was like you know working class everyone was into like the like i guess i don't i can't even really remember any of the street punk bands like the casualties and all those like you know split offs from that kind Mm -hmm. of genre but uh, so we were into that when we were kids, you know, like leather jackets, mohawks, and all that. And then when we moved to San Marcos, our friend Paul came to stay with us, and he had been like riding trains and stuff. And he's the one who showed us um, at the bunny stuff right. the first time. And that's that was the catalyst for the whole folk. Like that's when we really began to, you know, be able to see it like a. Uh, future and you know being able to actually just you know get out there and travel around and play music for a living I guess how fucking crazy is it is that that's so many like so many artists share that experience with with Pat the Bunny catalog you know oh, yeah. just any of his projects like, Definitely. like it, it one of the most influential you know folk punk artists well probably the most yeah I, I, don't I know. would definitely say that Pat's probably gotten the most people to pick up a a guitar and and play folk punk as in the in the you know folk punk world yeah i wonder what it was about his his writing or his style that that you know resonated with so many people i mean to me at least it it was just so accessible it's like i grew up listening to all these punk bands and i was like i can't afford you know like a amp or a drum kit you know there's no way i could move that around like to tour and stuff but i saw pat uh you know pat Pat could make me feel shit that those full bands could make me feel but just with an acoustic guitar and i was like well shit i have an acoustic guitar i guess i'll just try that and (laughs) it's kind of where it came from and like in terms of like 
Yeah, that is honestly fucking crazy. Because I, I feel like, I think I had like a, 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 a very similar re- revelation, but probably just like, 12 years after you did or some <laughs> shit, you know what I mean? Just, just like a million, I don't know. I mean, but yeah, it's fucking, it's, it's fucking wild. But in terms of like the traveler kids and stuff, I feel like maybe, cause we're in, we're in Boston and you know, I, it's probably a geographical thing, but you know, you don't really, you don't really get, you do get a lot of like traveling uh, people here, but what you don't really see is like train kids as far as I know considering like i feel like maybe in a in a landscape like texas like is it is it or i feel like trains or, or supply chain fucking train transportation is, is that just more part of the infrastructure of the southwest do you think like could you speak on that a little bit or um i mean there's not a lot of not a lot of people write the houston either it's kind of it's right. notoriously difficult to get out of here but i think uh, and I've never ridden through the Northeast, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, maybe it's the same deal up there. It seems like people tend to try and stick to the West Coast, you know, mm-hmm. where it's pretty mellow. Yeah. Interesting. I'm interested, too, when you're talking about, you were really in the, like, when you're talking about, like, the spiky jacket, like, mohawk kind of punk scene locally and when you were a little younger, and then how that compares to... Like, in terms of, like, the scene itself, like, the culture, the folk punk scene, what were the differences to you that really caught your eye and that made you really love that so much? Uh, I mean, my experience with the folk punk scene has just been so much more positive. And not to say that, you know, I'm not shitting on the, like, street punk scene or anything. I've definitely yeah, yeah. had fun in that scene as well. But uh, it definitely does seem like the kids in the folk punk scene are you know, actively trying to be more progressive and inclusive and accepting. It's just, it's kind of, it's an easier, more comfortable space to navigate, Mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm. I think there's still, there's still a lot of those, like, kind of old, angry thoughts and ideas that have stuck around in the, like, I get, like, leather jacket mohawk scene, as you put it. Yeah. That makes sense. Not to say there's not a place for that. I mean, it's nice to be able to put on some fucking angry music, you know, and (laughs) scream and shit. But if there's a a, a scene that I I had to pick one to, you know, continue, you know, to to work with uh, as far as like touring and booking shows and all that goes, um, it's just everyone's so accommodating in the folk punk scene. It's like, Mm-hmm. We've never been somewhere and played a folk punk show and then, like, not had a place to stay, you know. It's really nice. Yeah, we, we actually, a few months ago, interviewed a photographer by the name of Michael Joseph, who is pretty well known for his, uh, he does these Polaroid portraits of uh, traveling folks and, and uh, you know, train train hopping uh, people or people living that traveling lifestyle. And um, one thing that he said that I thought was an interesting connection to make was that that uh, that culture of, of, you know, people traveling around North America in, in, a, in this fashion, like, you know, as far as he knows, dates back all the way to like the, you know, Dust Bowl era or like turn of the century, like, you know, hobos like traveling around the countryside or something and playing country music and stuff. And I just think it's like so like and, 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 and with that being said, I I've like just find it so interesting that it seems like folk punk just kind of accidentally became another rung in that exact same tradition where like you know in american folklore you hear about like someone like johnny appleseed even is like you know was was like you know he's like basically like a yankee doodle song at this point but who he actually was he was like a traveling preacher and he would give sermons and teach people how to grow food and people would let him sleep on the floor of their houses at their farms and then send him on his way. And I just find it like just so fascinating that like, you know, that that traveling culture or just taking in random people and, and exchanging ideas and culture, like I just I I, I don't know. I guess I, I don't even know if this this isn't even necessarily a question, but <laughs> I'm, I'm on a fucking tangent no, right no, now. No, but I, I get yeah, it's interesting how <laughs> it's, it's just fucking crazy. Like uh, it's it's the folk hero, right? Like uh, you know, uh, 50, 80, 100 years from now, maybe, you know, Pat the Bunny is going to be their Johnny Appleseed. Kinda. Yeah. It's interesting how it, 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 it just circulates like that, continues on. 
Yeah, and like so, in terms of like you know, and, and getting back to your story too, like you know, after your first show, and then and this friend of yours that's like you know, riding the trains and introducing you to this new genre, and like you know, being inspired and, and projected and and you know, propelled forward into this you know, acoustic vision, you know, like what it like, did that take off really fast for you? Like, did you immediately start, re you know, recording and trying to distribute or like, you know, did you guys hit the road right away? Like what was like the first move after you guys really realized that days and days was like something you're going to keep doing? Um, I wrote a ton of songs with Whitney when we lived in San Marcos and we didn't really we would like come back to Houston and my parents had like a desktop computer that I had downloaded this little eight track recorder. That's literally all it was, was just like, I can't even remember the name of the program. There was no mixing or anything. It was just eight tracks and I <laughs> recorded little ideas and stuff um, over there, but it was still just for fun. I was like working at HEB and when he was going to school and uh, I think when she decided to drop out of school and move back to Houston that's maybe when the wheels kind of started spinning because we didn't, we were completely directionless really so uh, I put more time into recording and we started you know picking up some more shows uh, there's this place called Super Happy Funland in Houston that's still there it's like another giant warehouse kind of like the next iteration of Southmore after that place shut down we started playing a lot of shows there and you know meeting people and networking and uh after we released, I think it was maybe Here, Go Here Goes Nothing. Um, we uh, we just burnt it on a bunch of CDs and packed up our car. And our plan was just to leave with no shows booked. We were just going to go like around the country and stop at coffee shops and play open mics and like ask, you know, existing shows if we could hop on a bill. Mm. <laughs> uh, That's the morning crazy. that we were supposed to leave to do that, we walked out of our apartment and the back windshield of our car was shattered and we had put all our equipment in there the night before so we could just wake up and leave. No. But someone had stolen, <laughs> someone stole Whitney's trumpet. Uh, I think they took this little amp that I was gonna take with us too. Holy Luckily shit. I had kept my guitar inside, but That's awful. I kind of felt like the universe telling us to like pump the brakes and actually book some stuff. So we uh, <laughs> took a step back. <laughs> There's this website called dodiy.org. I'm not sure if it's still around. I've heard of but, this. Um, yeah, you, you, it sounds familiar. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was a classic of, I think, of the early 2010s. I don't know if they're still active, but I definitely heard heard about it very often. Yeah, that. I, I hope it's still around because it was such an incredible tool. Um, we went on that website and kind of just tracked down a bunch of contacts and it still wasn't like a solid tour by any means, but we booked some kind of route uh, <laughs> that went up to like the Northwest. And so we actually, you know, finally left on, on that little, I guess you could call it tour. And that was like the first, our first little, you know, wading out into the pond that is the scene. And, and, uh, you know, it just snowballs. You meet people and those people know people and the shows get a little bit better and you just keep at it. Hmm. Now those those original, you know, the and the, and that first time, like I I love that so much that you guys just were like, fuck it, let's just go find shows. Um, but like, in terms of like the first like like the beginning of trying to, you know, just really book and and stuff like that. Like how did like how was that learning curve, of like learning, those logistics or like traveling time or like what the fuck do I need to bring like. Like, like how, like, was that, I guess, would you, would you say that that was a learning curve or was it just flying by the seat of your pants all the time? Or like, do you guys feel like that was something you got better at? Yeah. I mean, we were definitely woefully unprepared at first. <laughs> um, we just, we had no idea really how any of it worked. So, uh, luckily, I mean, Whitney's pretty good at the logistical stuff. So she at least had, you know, like spreadsheets and all that like this is i think before we even had like map quest printouts because we didn't have like a gps at this point <laughs> Holy shit. This so long ago um so yeah it was there's a massive learning curve but i, I think once you kind of get 
a hold of like the basics, you know, of like the, the few things you need to have nailed down, it's, it kind of all comes together pretty easy. You can copy paste a little bit, you know? Yeah. And also just to, I, you kind of already said this, but you said you're in your early thirties now, and this was something like 15 years ago. So you guys are pretty young when you did all of this, right? For the first time. Yeah. I think the first time we hit the road, I was like maybe 16, 17. Oh, that's so crazy. That's awesome. Wait, so you, so you and Whitney were hitting the road for the first time as days and days when you were 16. Yeah. we were. That's- we, that's fucking crazy. Uh, I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I was like 17 because wow. the first time that my sister left, she was 16. I was 18. That's when we went on like the first little Chad H. George thing, I believe. Yeah. Whoa. Wow. Um, yeah, that is unbelievable. Cause like, ah, I lost my train of thought there a little bit. Well, that, I was gonna say that kind of makes it even more impressive <laughs> that you guys are just gonna go, <laughs> just full sense. <laughs> right. Cause like, I feel like. Yeah. For real. I've had many, many friends, and I, and I myself have tried, you know, my hand going out there and, like, booking shows and stuff. Mm. And I, you know, it's something that I feel like I experienced and that a lot of other people I know have experienced is a bit of, like, paralysis by analysis, in a sense, where a lot of people get trapped in this, like, Facebook message email hell <laughs> of just constantly, like, re- pushing things back or emailing or, like, look, searching desperately to, like, find all of these, like, I don't know, just, like, places to stay, this place, that place, where are we going to eat, where are we going to drive, how much are we going to cost, like, and I feel like that, like, you know, in my experience, that uh, overanalyzing can even, like, kill projects or, or stop the travel altogether. Like, did you find that there was a, a good mix in, in you guys' operation of, like, just pure chaos and just driving and, like, the, uh, the organization, or did that kind of give you guys any kind of edge? Or do you relate uh, to that? We definitely weighed on the side of pure chaos at the <laughs> beginning. There was very little, but like we, I don't even know if we left with any money because all <laughs> we would we would we would drive till we were almost on empty and stop at like a truck stop, and just open the trunk and sit down and like fly a sign and play music. We just had like an out of gas sign, and that's <laughs> how we would get gas to get to the next truck stop and so on and so forth till you know we eventually got somewhere where you play a show. Um, so there really wasn't there was no like gas mask done there was no uh like hotels accounted for where it was just sleeping bags and a lot of sleeping in and around the car um so i i think yeah a lot of the variables that some you know someone that's a lot more responsible <laughs> may, may have taken into account we kind of just didn't worry about it was really just can we play here? Okay, let's go there. And we just kind of figured it out on the way. Yeah. What was that like for you guys, like, as an experience? Because part of me wants to say that that sounds like it must have sucked so bad, but also it sounds so (laughs) fun. (laughs) Like, what was the lived experience of that like? There definitely was shitty times, you know, (laughs) Um, but when you're with a group of people like that that are all, you know, going through the same it's not even shitty i mean you're just driving around playing music with your friends i wouldn't say it was the most comfortable exactly all the time but it was always fun yeah and there's always i think we were a group of people especially at the time that really enjoyed like problem solving as well so whenever we were faced with an issue on the road it was always it was a really nice you know kind of team Mm-hmm. energy there's good synergy there we were, we were it was an easy group of people to work with and we always just did what we needed to do together to make it to the next spot and get the next show done yeah so in a hypothetical situation if like you were just like at your local 7-eleven or something <laughs> and a van of, of local teenagers pulled up to you and said hey we're gonna do right now exactly everything that you just said we're hitting the fucking road you know what I mean? Like, how would you counsel those kids? Like, would you say, dude, go home? Or would you say, oh, here's what you got to do? Like, what would you say to, like, a group of uh, kids in 2023 doing trying to do the exact same thing? Yeah, no, I'd definitely say go for it. I would say maybe uh, print out, like, one of those <laughs> QR codes so people driving by can just, like, scan it and Venmo you because oh, I feel yeah. like cash isn't wow. as, like, readily available. So, you know, busking 
you kind of got to, you know, change with the times. Yeah. But, uh, Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I would not dissuade them at all. I, I, I implore you to get out there and, and do everything you can to make it happen as soon as you possibly can. Yeah. That was very practical and positive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, would you... Um, I'm curious to know too, like how did people, how were people responding to you guys? Like not just like the listeners at, at, at shows and stuff, but like, you know, like people at these gas stations or, or people like in the towns you were showing up in to play, like were, did you find that people were kind to you or did you feel like things were kind of like tough, you know, dealing with the, with the people on the road? It's always been overwhelmingly positive. Um, wow. I mean, aside from like the cops, of course, have always been fucking assholes. Right. But you know, that's a given. But like, yeah. just random. I mean, we've had people multiple, you know, more times than I could count. Someone will just come like tell us to pull the car up to a, you know, gas pump and fill the tank up, or like, oh. you know, to swing by and drop off like some food from like a fast food restaurant down the street or you know our van's broken down of course tons of times and a bunch of times someone just pulls over and helps us fix it or they know somebody in the nearest town that can help out you know so yeah without the kindness of strangers there are so many times that we would have just been left high and dry in the middle of absolutely nowhere you know yeah uh, so yeah shout out to all those people that found us on the side of the road or you know, pitched us a couple bucks to get down the street. That's such a lovely thing to hear that most people are good, <laughs> you know? Yeah, uh, uh, being out there and, 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 you know, really kind of just tossing yourself into, you know, the tossing yourself into the wind and kind of relying on the kindness of strangers will really renew your faith in humanity because it's not like all doom and gloom, you know, you doom scroll through your like facebook feed and it looks like makes you kind of feel like everyone's a monster out there but yeah i think the overwhelming majority of people regardless of you know creed or station are you know good at heart and willing to help yeah when you guys tour now is it a similar kind of style no um we've kind of we're lucky enough now to have a few friends that can like you know, book solid shows mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, like, uh, guarantees and things. So yeah, we're super, super lucky. And, uh, it's not lost on me how fortunate we are to not have to, you know, play music at gas stations anymore. <laughs> now it's, a, it's a lot more cut and dry, which is nice. It's more comfortable, but I mean, there is, it's less adventurous. So, I mean, now it's more of like a job and, uh, not to say, that it's not like the greatest job in the world and that I would want to do anything else, but it is, you know, point A to point B to point C to point D, you know, instead of like a, we, we tour now, we don't really travel as much, if that mm. makes sense. Yeah, that's an interesting distinction. In terms of you guys as touring right now, I mean, you know, you guys are, you know, doing some like very, very significant shows with uh, some really cool people and, uh, you know, I've, I've noticed in the past few years, you guys have linked up with like, uh, is it no effects? Yeah. How is, how did that, uh, relationship come to be, you know, with these guys that are like some of like probably the biggest names in, in contemporary punk, you know, no effects, like, you know, did they, how did you, I guess, how did you meet them or like, did they reach out to you or? Yeah, you know, I'm not, I don't even really know the story <laughs> exactly. I think what happened is that someone showed Sturgeon from Leftover Crack our music, mm -hmm. uh, and then he, we we like played a, we backed him for a few like acoustic shows um, around like Casey Mo I think, and then and then we went on tour with Leftover Crack, and then. I think Sturgeon showed Mike our music and 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 Mike enjoyed it and then those you know he asked if we wanted to do a record with them and of course we jumped at the chance to do songs on a fat wreck. Been listening to No Effects since I was you know a kid, so it was kind of it's just networking, I guess, like how right. you know, anything else works like that, you know. Mm. Yeah, well, that must have been so exciting though to get that message. Oh, it was 
ridiculous. I, can't, like, <laughs> I don't know if I've ever felt that like welling up of excitement and joy before, save maybe like my wedding day, I guess. But aside <laughs> nice. from that, like, yeah, it was like every Christmas morning you've ever experienced all packed into one. Oh, that's sick. How have you found, like, the business side of all this shit? Because, like, it's, like, a pretty famous sentiment, you know, in, in punk rock. Like, you know, like, fuck the label, like, fuck what, no gods, no, you know, all this, like, kind of, you know, uh, anti-authority, anti-capitalist shit. I'm not, I'm not asking you, like, a question like that. But, I mean, like, how did you, <laughs> how did you find that, like, that learning curve, I guess, even, like, growing from, like, I guess, like, this, this, like, super DIY, no money required you know, situation to kind of entering a different echelon, you know, of, of, uh, of, of production and, and touring and, and, and this and that. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a lot smoother of a transition than we had anticipated. We were like, when we went out to go record with fat for the first time, we were all nervous as hell. Like I, yeah. I, I, I was freaking out, but we got there. Cause I mean, we'd just been recording like in my parents closet, for a decade or whatever right like, yeah. we didn't know what the hell we were doing how any of this worked but they were so accommodating and patient with us like it was it was just the greatest experience and they're still fantastic to work with now we've i mean i feel like we're, maybe we're just really lucky in that regard but we've I, they've been nothing but a pleasure to work with Mm. And are they, were they, are they the first, um, I, I don't know if you'd even call it a major label, are they the, the first big label you guys have worked with? Have you guys done anything else with other uh, production companies? Yeah, we worked with, you know, some like little labels here and there on like sure. split releases or, you know, like one-offs, uh, flail records we've, we've done some stuff with, but yeah, no, uh, no X Fat Records is definitely like the first big big you know label that we ever did anything with mm. i guess to change gears a little bit too um I, I i you know before to preface this this question i don't know a ton about this genre anyway but i i kind of was curious about this idea of like uh, or the you know the background of of leftover crack and i believe they call the type of music crack rock steady and this and that but like were you surprised to find yourself associated with that uh that lineage or that kind of brand i guess of music or that you know that that world i mean obviously you guys are both punk bands you know but i find i I find it interesting that you guys are are so heavily associated with that sound um i or maybe you would disagree that no no no. i I think we're definitely kind of lumped into that gotcha Um, that genre i guess a little bit Mm -hmm. um i don't think it's really that surprising i our music was so heavily influenced by you know all those steady seven bands um so i mean it would make sense that if you like those bands you would like music that's (laughs) kind of inspired by them right yeah of course that makes sense Uh, i mean (laughs) instrumentally it's they're nothing alike but like at the at the core of it like the structures of the songs are like melodic but kind of raspy stuff mixed together uh with the sky yeah, it's all the pieces are there so i could see how people would think it's similar mm. and in terms of like um I, I completely just fucking fucked up my train of thought oh <laughs> um my bad yeah if you haven't noticed by now also we're um pretty off the cuff and just we're recording this in a library right now <laughs> actually we don't have a studio nice. so we definitely relate to you know your story in a lot of ways in terms of what we do because we just kind of uh record this like on a phone and just let it rip and you know a lot of people have asked us in the past about like you know the idea of the boston art podcast and stuff and we just kind of made it up <laughs> i guess you know the but, name yeah nice Anywho. That's the way to do it. Uh, just go for it, right? Yeah, it's worked out so far, so. <laughs> so in terms of uh, the current state of, like, folk punk and, and things like this, like, have you found, like, you know, when you guys are playing at, at, at real venues, like, you know, booked in, in such a way or different from how things once were, 
are you guys still playing with a, like a lot of local openers and um, I guess smaller folk punk bands or, or newer bands? Yeah, for sure. We always try and get uh, local local folks on the shows. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll usually travel with like one band that we know, but you gotta have like someone local, right? You can't just show up to the town and be like, yeah. "Hey, <laughs> we don't know anybody here. We're gonna play music." Uh, but yeah, we it, it's. I mean, it keeps it exciting too because you know, I I still very much enjoy seeing live music, so I want to see you know, what's going on in that town and kind of get my finger on the pulse of every city. So, yeah, we try and play with as many local bands as we possibly can. That's awesome. That sounds like a really good way to meet people, meet other musicians, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> How many of these bands do you think you've seen come and go over the years, too? Because going at it for, like, you know, over or about 15 years, like, you know, you've probably seen countless uh, uh, projects come and go over time like you know do you find that these new projects that you see popping up are the same like groups of people starting new works or do you like feel like it's a brand new scene like every, every day um, it's a little of both I mean there's definitely like mainstays of the scene there are certain people that were there when we kind of entered it and you know they're still hanging around doing what they were doing when we started or you know they've started new projects but uh, i mean also there's there's new artists popping up every day even in houston i mean we didn't play in our hometown for like kind of a long time there over like covid and then you know we got caught up in like a bunch of out of town shows but we recently uh played a show at this new place called a relatively new place called Trip Six, and there's just so many kids I've never seen before. They're like just starting out, like just starting, you know, starting up bands, which it makes me really hopeful. It's also, you know, it's cool to know that the scene here isn't dying. It's going to be inherited by a by the younger generation. So yeah, yeah. I mean, th there's the old head old heads around still, of course, um, but. But yeah, there's definitely a ton of new music uh, all the time, luckily. Well, something that I've noticed, I don't know if it's true everywhere, but something I've been noticing about the Boston scene at least is that something that was a side effect of everybody kind of getting benched with COVID happening was all of these people turning toward to art and music that either were already involved in it or were coming to it for the first time, kind of having all this pent up energy and then all of a sudden coming out into the scene with a fully formed band or fully formed portfolio that before when they were would have been in the scene in the first place maybe weren't there yet so it's kind of cool to see like these projects just pop out of the blue and new people joining and getting into it now that we can kind of do that more again yeah that's um definitely the case in houston and it's it seems like a bunch of people had a bunch of free time yeah and you know they channeled that in a really interesting way and, and now we have a bunch of new bands out here to play with so that's you know silver lining i guess right yeah <laughs> In terms of, too, of your experience, you know, with all these countless shows at, at different places, do you ever find, feel like your memories of all of these is, like, almost, like, it's almost like a memory of, of just, like, white no a white noise of experiences? Like, do you feel, like, do you ever, like, because, like, something I've, I've found, like, with, with art, you know, with artists, people will ask me, what kind of art do I make or, or what do I do? And I, like, I just feel completely... Like, I just draw a blank immediately, but, like, <laughs> I guess I'm saying, like, when you, you know, like, do you ever find it hard to even, like, describe, like, how this has been for you or, or I guess some of the places and people you've seen, you know, with it being so many? I feel like that question makes no fucking sense at all, but. No, no, it makes perfect sense. It's definitely a, a whirlwind, like, thinking back on just kind of the whole of, you know, what we've done over the last 15 or whatever years that's it's just a, a tornado of memories um and it's hard to pinpoint like the stepping stones really like i was you know like i was saying i was having trouble you know i don't even know how we got on that wreck exactly <laughs> you know i have like a vague you know uh like trail of breadcrumbs there but yeah it's i mean and like being hammered like a lot of the time does not help at all either it's hard to like 
I feel like any any time you go on a trip, you know, even if it's just like a vacation or something, any time that you're the scenery around you is constantly changing every day. When you get back to the place that you're kind of, you know, settled down and you think back on those times, it's always going to be like kind of a haze, right? Even if you are sober, even if you're taking tons of pictures the whole time, it's like you're caught up in the present, which is how you should be. Mm. But then when you get back and, and think back on the past, it's always, it's always kind of scattered, right? Yeah. How the fuck do you process all that? Like, what do you like do? And like, when you're when you come home and like the tour's over, like, you just like s- sit there, like, what the fuck did I just do? <laughs> like, what? there definitely is that like kind of post party depression period right? yeah. where you like. Uh, I I mean I and I know I shouldn't think like this. I know this is kind of the bane of our society is that we correlate value to productivity, and right. I try stay away from that as much as I can but I still do feel like the more that I'm doing the more value I possess you know the better I feel about myself so when I'm on the road I'm doing something every day there's like a clear-cut purpose Mm -hmm. uh, that I have a job to do and I can get it done and and, you know I I, I feel fine though when I get home and there's this stagnancy right and I know I should just be kind of relaxing and basking in the job well done but knowing that there's nothing to get done every day does kind of like it does put me in a little bit of a depressive period every time we get back I guess so I need to I probably do need to work on like a better way to process all of those experiences and memories Uh, I'll I'll work on that moving forward I guess (laughs) it makes sense though because it's such a uh, rapid fire like you're busy all the time like a lot of adrenaline and a lot of like positivity every single day and then getting back into even if it's not anything bad but just the mundane probably feels really weird to just have that happen as soon as you come home you know yeah it is just everything kind of comes to a screeching halt you know and it's it's it is a it's not the greatest feeling i don't think at least to me yeah and and, and, i I like to keep moving in terms of processing too you find like i found in a lot of like therapeutic advice or settings like that a lot of people will encourage someone to to draw it out or to write or to make a little to sing a song to to process it but like do you find that that's like you know with with art and music being your job you know it's like do you feel like those forms of processing are like almost not available to you because it's associated with you know your I guess your purpose or you know what you do every day Uh, no that's absolutely how I process all that when when we're on the road i i don't write anything i just take little notes little Mm. like uh you know lines or even just words that pop into my head or you know i'll record like a little melody that that pops in my head when we're just sitting in the car for you know eight hours at a time or whatever and i i just won't look at it again until i get back and then i'll go through all my notes and all my little melodies and Mm. kind of start writing everything so i guess that is kind of how i how I am, um, how I process. I get, yeah, mm. you're right. I just, I, I never <laughs> thought about it myself. <laughs> oh, oh. And um, you've touched on it a bit, you know, in this conversation, and it's, you know, such a massive part of of you guys' like, you know, your ethos and, and in your writing, but, you know, alcoholism and, and mental, I don't know if you would say mental illness, but, you know, these these feelings and the experiences are such a massive uh, uh, part of, of, of the content of what you guys are doing. And, like, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if you mentioned if, if you're in recovery or not, but, like, I guess, like, how, do, how have you found that the the struggle to, you know, overcome some of these battles has, has affected, you know, your, your journey in, in terms of touring and music making? Um, I, I am sober. Uh, cool. I, 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 I mean, it, it's, it was fun partying when we were younger, you know, and and uh, showing up every you know, a party every night, you can only do that for so long, right? Before it mm. becomes a, a habit. <clears throat> um, so, like, I, I wouldn't take back all the like drunken, sloppy times. Those were great, and and a lot of our songs came out of that. And then we met a lot of friends from all that debauchery and nonsense. <laughs> but uh, man, it is just everything is so much easier sober it's mm. like easier to write it's easier to play it's easier to 
plan tours. It's easier to, you know, send emails. It's easier just to talk to kind folks like y'all over the phone for a little bit. You know, I, mm-hmm. I didn't have to slam like five shots before I <laughs> got on the phone with y'all, which is, you know, incredibly liberating. So though alcohol and drug addiction has played a massive role in who I am and who we are as people and as a band, um, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I would not go back. I think the like tortured artist cliche is mm. kind of bullshit. I think you can you, you you make the best art when you're in you know your own mind and not being tugged in different directions by some chemicals, you know. Yeah. I'm in recovery too and I definitely relate in terms of of just everyday living and art making, but also in terms of just you know loving people and connecting with people, you know, cuz I feel like I I feel like I literally didn't experience empathy until I was was sober. You know, I I was yeah. I couldn't perceive it in other people and I didn't know how to act it out like I was just like a fucking you know, basically like an alien <laughs> or like a fucking animal. Yeah. It's a it at least for me it, it's impossible to make any real meaningful connection when I'm fucked up. It, though it feels like it, that's what's happening in the moment because I'm fucked up there's no actual lasting memory or relationship or feeling there. So yeah, the, uh, I, I just gets in the way of everything. And how is, I guess, so yeah, it's, it's, so I imagine you've been in, in kind of an, an, a new universe, you know, in, in terms of, of your, your creativity and the, and the touring, I can't imagine, um, doing that at a high level you know at, at the level such as as yourself you know in terms of logistics and, and, and business and the creativity and and to and to have that you know uh that chaos you know following close behind you know so i guess it's very you know congratulations <laughs> i guess you know in terms Thanks. Of, in terms of that's <laughs> fucking you. awesome because you know we get to to have you in this world continuing to uh, to make your music you know thanks I, I plan on trying to stick around <laughs> yeah holy shit right but yeah i guess too i mean maybe i don't know if like this is like weird to fucking just like hang around hang and simmer on on alcoholism or not but you know let me know if it if it gets into like a weird place or something but <laughs> um but yeah, in terms of like oh what are you gonna say that was, i was just saying it's it's all good I'm oh fuck not yeah. weird at all for sure <laughs> Yeah, in terms of, like, the shows and stuff, you know, I mean, I think I've only seen you guys play one time as a band, and it was, like, you know, such a fucking, like, crazy, wild experience, and you guys were obviously, you know, so alive, but the audience, you know, itself was just this fucking, you know, a force of of, of people and and just this, like, beautiful energy, and, you know, people are, are drinking and connecting with each other and having fun and shit, like was that kind of like, you know, with that being part of like, you know, with that being such an integral part of like culture and and, and music and and shit, like, did you feel like that was kind of like, um, did you feel like that was, was difficult to adapt to, you know, in in recovery? Because in my experience, I actually uh, coincidentally never uh, went to shows at all uh, in addiction. I only started going to shows and playing them after I got sober. So I didn't, uh, which is kind of a random fact, but I guess I'm curious about how that transition went for you. Uh, it was, I mean, it was definitely terrifying the first time. I still remember the first time I played a sober show. Um, it was on tour with Leftover Crack. I had like, <laughs> on that tour, I was drinking like a fifth to a gallon of vodka a day just to like Holy not shit, shake. Dude. Uh, so I was drinking like, you know, 10 shots before you get on stage and it had been fine the whole tour, but I, we rolled into town. I can't remember what city it was, but, uh, I, you know, I took my like seven or eight shots or whatever, just to get out of the van. And I picked up my guitar and I just like, couldn't play. Like I couldn't, my hands wouldn't move. Right. Like I was just so exhausted and like malnourished and dehydrated I just couldn't do it and uh so they took me to the hospital I missed that show and they just detoxed me at the hospital I think I missed like a week of shows Uh, and then we just hopped right back on the tour um 
like newly sober and I got up in front of like a, a few hundred people with this guitar and like I remember shaking more than I had ever shaked from not drinking um, and trying to like trying to play and missing the strings and like trying to sing and like not like feeling like my vocal cords were somebody else's vocal cords it was so strange but we got through that first show and everyone was like so supportive uh at that show they they all knew that i had been off the tour and that was my first show back and my first sober show and it was just like an outpouring of love i cannot express my gratitude to the people that were at that first show and to everyone that was on that tour for being so supportive of of, of me staying sober on the rest of that tour but like once i got that first show out of the way it was it just got easier and easier and by the end of the tour it was like the most fun I'd ever had on stage because I was fully in the moment. I felt like, you know, I, I felt like my body was functioning properly, which is always a plus, but like, I felt like I really had control over where the song was going, you know, like where, how my voice was reacting to it. Like it was, it was, uh, it was the best. I think they, they call that like, honeymoon period with sobriety the pink cloud mm. and I was very much in the pink cloud for the rest of that tour but um, I'm lucky that I was because that was like the best introduction to sober shows ever and I mean still it is kind of hard the like the social aspect of it when once you get off stage and you're talking to people that's obviously a lot easier when the social lubricant is flowing you know mm. um, and you're a little more uninhibited but but I think that, you know, it's just like practice. The more you talk to people while you're sober, the easier it gets. And I'm still like a little awkward and trip up on my words, you know, but, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I'm getting used to it and it's overall a much more pleasant experience than it ever was hammered. And I can remember it now. There's yeah. so many like awesome shows we've played that I just have no recollection of, which I'm, which I, which really bumps me out. <laughs> That first time up there sober, was that an emotional experience for you? Oh, yeah, it was. I, I was shaken to the core at the beginning of the night and just on top of the world by the time the show was done. It was it was super, super intense. That's so that's such like a, a beautiful thing, too, because, you know, I uh, a lot of alcoholics may commiserate over the fact with each other that um the first day of sobriety is usually like the result of like the worst fucking thing that ever happened to you <laughs> or something <laughs> like some yeah. fucking awful thing, you know? So it's really cool that, you know, well, you know, with whatever, maybe the days, the time is blurry, but you know, to be thrown back out there and to be caught by like open arms of these people that, that love you and, and your friends and what you're saying, that must've been fucking surreal. Yeah, it was, it's indescribable. It was, I, have, I mean, I'm so fucking lucky to have ever been in that position. And what do you think, too? Like, I mean, you know, I guess to look at it from the other side, too, like, what do you think stopped you from, I, I mean, if I had to guess, you know, I would say that probably wasn't your first, um, <laughs> you know, you know, like medical situation or like, I don't know. It pro that probably you probably had crazy ass times before that. But I guess why why do you think that was the moment where you were like why did why did you feel like you even wanted to try to be sober? You know, like what do you think about that time period made you like be like you know what fuck it I'll I'll roll the dice I'll try to do the rest of this tour, you know, or or, or you know why not why why not drink again? I guess it's kind of a fucked up question, but <laughs> yeah, I mean. I was on tour with one of my favorite bands of all time, I was, and I I cared about playing the music more than you know anything else. And I knew that if it was either you know booze or music, and the choice was obvious to me at the time, and it still is. Uh, yeah, that's. I, I think if I had tried to do it at home with you know no stakes presented to me, mm -hmm. maybe it wouldn't have worked as well, but. Yeah. That's actually a really interesting point because, yeah, because if you were just a reg maybe just, you know, chilling at home or, or just somewhere on the street in your own city, like, 
maybe you would have had the misfortune of feeling like fuck it like why like what the fuck do i what do i have to do anyway you know so to have something to lose what must have been easy get a case of the fuck it's every now and again and i think if you don't have something to prevent you from going through with that you know you're gonna relapse i think that's why like the support groups and everything are so uh important to a lot of people that are in recovery it's because you need that accountability you need Mm -hmm. i mean everyone needs purpose right and you need something to keep you on track because if you are an alcoholic or you know addiction prone left to your own devices left to our own devices you know at least me i know if i didn't have music if i didn't have you know my family to 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 hang out with me and and you know things that i care about i would 100 percent pick the bottle back up in a heartbeat Mm. Mm. in terms of support groups and stuff too when you originally uh you're this 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 like uh original journey into into sobriety on, on tour was that uh was that any time before you had gone into any kind of program or were you already you know familiar with the with with the kind of meeting culture yeah no that was my first <clears throat> kind of i mean i'd been like hospitalized for seizures and stuff before it was definitely not like my first time trying to get sober i guess but every time before that you know i got out of the hospital and within like a week i was you know back off the wagon but mm-hmm. it really helped having uh, brad logan there uh love for crack he's been sober for like 20 years some shit like that oh wow uh and and yeah and they do a like an a meeting at the venue before the shows and stuff so really it was cool to yeah have be surrounded by I mean, that guy's been a huge help. They, they do, like, uh, Zoom, it's like, punk rock AA Zoom meetings and stuff that I've been to a couple of times. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wow. So before so before you had, had, had gotten sober, were you just kind of seeing them do the these meetings and stuff and just kind of been like, huh, that's cool. Peace. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pretty much, like, <laughs> verbatim. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you, you never, it, it always seems so stupid to be, you know, honest. Like, when you're drinking, it seems dumb. You're like, that's never going to help me. This is a waste of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then once you get sober and you just give it a shot, you know, and kind of let go of your pride and ego and just talk to folks, it is a tremendous help, uh, at least, you know, to me. I understand that, you know, not everything works for everybody, but... Right. Do you find too that the the tour, with touring and shows or like are you having more people come up to you after gigs and and sharing their experiences and stuff with with their sobriety? Yeah, I definitely had uh, people talk to me at shows. I get like messages from people some of the time. I I always appreciate talking to other people who are in the same boat. I mean, just knowing that you're not alone in all this is such a. Uh, you know a boon to your confidence and you know keep your spirits up because i mean when you feel like you're the only one going through it and you start to feel hopeless that's when you can you know the wagon starts to get a little slippery Mm. right yeah wow that's like seems like i don't know if like you have any like spiritual inclination but that seems so perfect that all of that would have happened with this you know, super strong support, like right there on tour with you already with like this recovery infrastructure, you know, yeah. built, built around him and, and his people, you know, and for you to be able to just join right in there sounds like just fucking like, you know, too, too good to be true. Just fucking amazing that that, that happened that way. Yeah, it was, it was pretty funny that I got sober on a leftover crack tour <laughs> never, ever in a million years saw that coming you know um but yeah it it was interesting how that lined up i'm not like spiritual i'm spiritual or religious or anything but i do recognize when shit lines up like oddly perfect for sure (laughs) oh wow 
Yeah, Jesus Christ, man. It's like you I think you've got you've definitely got a hell of a story too. And you know, I really wanted to uh, I wanted to ask you to come come do our show actually for a long time, but we just, you know, finally got around to it. But I just I've always felt like just after watching, you know, uh, you guys like your career and 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 seeing you guys here and there and, and and knowing you know some of the extremely distant lore you know as it as it reaches the east coast you know i always felt like you would have this, a really cool perspective on on shit like this well i really appreciate y'all having me on to chat y'all are just really really great people to talk to i mean i've <laughs> done like a handful of these podcast things you know and sometimes they're just kind of difficult to navigate or like yeah. you know i don't really i'm kind of like waiting for the other person to talk and you know i'm not the i'm not like an expert conversationalist or anything i'm a little <laughs> bit awkward but y'all have been an absolute pleasure to chit chat with yeah and to and to and to bend your ear a little bit too like you know and to talk shop about podcasts as well you know some a big part of our mission was like I have always felt like I'm, I'm in no way commenting on any existing like music journalist or anyone like this, but like I like have always like felt weird about, you know, having conversations or interviews with bands and musicians where it's just like, what type of guitar do you use? Or like, what, <laughs> what type of strings do you buy at the guitar store? What is the most reliable? I don't know. Like, it's just like, I don't know. I just want to, I feel like it's just cool to just fucking see the, the the artist or this person that you you admire and you care about their art to just see them as a fucking person you know yeah i was so, i don't know assume that would make for a better listening experience right you know, I you hope could just, so. like, i'm glad that you think <laughs> i'm glad that you think that right? <laughs> by taking a picture of your of your pedal board to for reference later or something <laughs> right yeah. jesus but yeah, no. I mean, I just want to say too, like it's it, it's it's a pleasure to have have you on here, and mm. like you know, I don't want to blow too much smoke up your ass as well. But like you know, your band and and everything that that you've accomplished and in this in this genre and and you know online and stuff was like a huge inspiration to me. You know, my high school self and and back in the day and and me and my friends trying to you know make an impact on on our community. So I don't know. It means the absolute world to me. You've got no idea, man. It's like a, hmm. I mean, it, it's that, it's so, it's surreal. I don't know. When I first started writing stupid little songs in San Marcos, never did I think that it would lead to where I am now or that anyone else would ever give a shit. So knowing that I had some little bit of impact on, you know, someone else's journey just makes my fucking day, man. Thank you very much for that. Of course. And, and like, I don't want to like, drive it home too much but like i got friends that you know had the exact same experience you know where you were definitely a part of that too with you know diy venues you know existing to this day that were you know started after like watching you know fucking misanthropic drunken loner you know what i'm saying like <laughs> the legacy <laughs> exists in in ways that you'll never know you'll never know the extent oh, so I it's pretty sick. Congratulations. deeply appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know what time it uh, is for you, but I assume you've got a dinner to get to. I do, yes. Very cool. Yeah, so I hope, you, uh, I hope you have a wonderful time with your folks. I hope the weather in uh, Texas is nice. And, uh, yeah, I guess not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Fuck, but right. Yeah, I'm sure. But, hey, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on and, um, uh, and yeah, yeah, fuck yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll 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 keep in uh, we'll keep up with with your journey and, and what's next for you, man. And uh, but yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, y'all have a fantastic 2023. Yeah, Hell you yeah. too. You too. Stay safe. Bye bye. 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 Boston Art Podcast is an independent DIY production by Brian Huntress and Theodora Earthworms. The information contained in this episode represents the views and opinions of the original creators or our guests, and does not represent any institution, organization, or business. Find us on Instagram at Boston Art Podcast, and tune in for a new episode every Friday. Thank you for listening.